After the First World War, people in Newfoundland and Labrador wanted a way to remember the men and women who had served overseas and to honor the war dead. They decided that a memorial should be built, but just what shape it would take was a subject of debate. The fighting had lasted far longer than anyone had initially anticipated, and the cost in human lives was enormous. People all across the Dominion were in mourning. What kind of a memorial could help them find meaning and consolation after they had lost so much? Some favored a statue or sculpture, a beautiful work of art that people could visit to reflect on the terrible cost of war. Others wanted something less traditional. They called upon the government to build a university, a living memorial that would benefit the wider society and bring about far-reaching, positive change. In the end, the Newfoundland government decided to establish both kinds of memorials. It opened the Memorial University College on September 15, 1925. At first, it was small, a single building that housed a library, classrooms, offices, and science labs. In 1949, the college became a degree-granting institution. Today, the Memorial University encompasses dozens of buildings spread across campuses in St. John's, Corner Brook, and Harlow, England. The Newfoundland government also built a national war memorial in downtown St. John's. About 20,000 people watched its unveiling on the morning of July 1, 1924, eight years after the Newfoundland regiment's tragic advance at Beaumont Hamill. Sculptors Ferdinand Victor Blundstone and Gilbert Bays designed the statues, and E.J. Parlanti cast them in bronze. Today, people still gather at the National War Memorial to remember the men and women who served in the First World War and in other battles. At the very top of the memorial stands a woman. She holds a torch in her left hand, which represents freedom. In her right hand, she holds a sword, a symbol of the Dominion's willingness to serve in the First World War. Below her stand four other bronze figures. A sailor of the Newfoundland Royal Naval Reserve, a soldier of the Royal Newfoundland Regiment, a woodsman of the Newfoundland Forestry Corps, and a fisherman of the Mercantile Marine. Added to these two sites are many smaller memorials that were established across Newfoundland and Labrador after the war. Some of the earliest were built at places like Trinity, Botwood, Arnold's Cove, Grand Falls, and Grand Bank. One of the most famous is the Fighting Newfoundlander. It was unveiled in Bowering Park in St. John's on September 13, 1922. Captain Basil Gatto sculpted the statue and he modeled it on Corporal Thomas Pittman, a soldier of the Newfoundland Regiment who had served on the front lines in the Battle of Beaumont Hamel. A second of Gatto's statues also stands in Bowering Park. It is a bronze caribou, the emblem of the Newfoundland Regiment. Gatto made five other caribou statues. They were installed at places in Europe where the Royal Newfoundland Regiment fought. Four of the memorial parks are in France at Beaumont Hamel, Manchi Le Preau, Masnier, and Goudicourt. The fifth is at Courtrai in Belgium. In each place, the bronze caribou gazes in the same direction that the men of the Newfoundland Regiment would have faced their enemy. Landscape architect Rudolf Kosius designed all of the European memorial parks. He also did Bowering Park in St. John's. The most elaborate of the European parks is at Beaumont Hamel. Newfoundland could not afford to spend extravagant sums of money in the 1920s, but Kosius was determined that Beaumont Hamel would not pale in comparison to the battlefield parks that other, richer nations were establishing across Europe. The Canadians, the South Africans, the Australians, the New Zealanders, they're all doing great things in commemorating their dead and their deeds and are spending millions in doing so. We will not, however, stand one foot behind any of them. And though their millions will only be thousands in this case, Beaumont Hamel will not stand behind Vimy Ridge Park or DeVille Wood. The Beaumont Hamel Memorial Park was officially opened on June 7, 1925. 
The site is dedicated to the memory of the Newfoundlanders and Labradorians who served in the First World War, and it specifically commemorates the people who died in the war but have no known grave. Its 30 hectares include the Caribou Monument, the Battlefield Terrain, and three cemeteries. While he was designing the park, Kosius decided to leave the surrounding terrain largely undisturbed. I felt too that the spot should be preserved in its wartime state, with its trenches, its no man's land, its dugouts, a perpetual reminder for future generations as a sacred ground. All five sites remain places of pilgrimage for people from Newfoundland and Labrador who want to honor the regiment and remember the men and women who served in the First World War and in other battles. Today, people in Newfoundland and Labrador are still finding new ways to remember the war. Books are still being written, documentaries filmed, and new statues cast in bronze. In 2014, the sculptor Morgan MacDonald began work on an ambitious project that will not only commemorate those who fought and died during the First World War, but also their descendants. This is 100 Portraits of the Great War. What we're doing is we're commemorating the anniversary of the First World War and particularly the Newfoundland contingent and the idea is that we're getting descendants of soldiers, sailors, mercantile marine and you know the, the wider Newfoundland contingent and we're not just focusing on the Newfoundland regiment uh, but what, what's happening is they're coming in and they're they're getting life masks done so the descendant of this soldier or sailor, service, service person that that served is, is getting their life mask done and, and so what happens is they, they come into the studio here and they sit down for a session and, and we're going to be casting a hundred of these portraits of the descendants in bronze. The volunteers sit for about 15 minutes encased in the alginate. Once that hardens, Morgan and his team remove it. Hot wax is poured into the mold and in just a few minutes hardens into a detailed mask. Good. You want to check the plaster there, see if it's... Later on, Morgan will use this wax mask to create a ceramic mold. It takes about a month for that to harden. Once it does, liquid hot bronze is poured in and the final sculpture is created. A lifelike rendition that will survive for generations to come. The, the core of this idea is that we're a hundred years later, but, but what the experience of these people, it's, it's still a moving thing and, and the hope is that it's not forgotten, you know, the, the, the experience of the, the Great War. And, but but it, instead of memorializing it a hundred years later and trying to go back a hundred years and then, you know, here's a, here's a you know, a, a cenotaph or, or a memorial, you know, kind of a static thing, it, it's, it's more of a commentary on the, the moving target of you know what it what it means and you know what what descendants mean what ancestry is and what your what your heritage is you know that's that's what it's all about is is just trying to eke out that family history and and record that and, and at least leave some kind of legacy it's it's not going to be you know a total history of the war but uh, at the very least it's you know recording these people their their stories and and it acts as a uh, i guess a token of of the greater experience